Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to uh, How to Retouch with Color Accuracy. Um, this evening, I have the great pleasure of being joined by Mr. Bob Campbell from uh, On One, and uh, he'll be taking us through the first half of the, uh, the evening session, and then I'll be uh, picking up afterwards and uh, running through the second half talking about uh, color management and giving you some tips and tricks and really highlights from some of the shows that we've done so far this year in particular the, the photography show in Birmingham that we were uh, both at very recently and uh, saw lots and lots of people perhaps some of you guys and girls so uh, but first and foremost it's uh, now I think over to me to introduce Bob and say hi Bob how are you doing hi Richard I'm doing fine how are you doing this evening yeah. good not too bad, mate. Not too bad. Bit of a Get bit going. of a uh, bit of a uh, bad back, but apart from that, we're fine. So as long as I don't have to lift anything in this session, we'll be good. <laughs> um, so without further ado, we'll, we'll uh, hand over to Bob, and he can uh, take us through the joys of On One and uh, their latest release of uh, of their software. So uh, I'll just pass you over. Thanks, Richard. So so Richard's going to hand me control of the screen. So I'm expecting to see a little box appear in the middle of my screen any second. And then I'll take you through a presentation of On One Software. So let's just show the screen. And everybody's thinking, I wonder what he means. Show the screen. Now my screen will probably take a few seconds to appear on everybody's screens. Richard, if you could just let me know that it's happening, that would be great. Oh, yeah, yeah, we're good. And it, yeah. is it there? Fantastic. Yeah, we're there now. So, I'm uh, Managing Director for On One Software um, outside of North America, so Europe, Middle East, Africa, Far East, anywhere, you name it, we're there somewhere. Um, and that's me drinking a cup of tea, uh, flying on my sofa, so making a cup of tea, drinking a cup of tea. My email address is bcampbell at ononesoftware.com. So if you want to go and get yourself something called a pencil, or something called a pen and a piece of paper, maybe from a museum, write that note down there, the email address, and uh, you'll be able to send me any files that you're having problems with, and I'll be able to comment, them, uh, comment on them for you. So the first slide, in a two-slide presentation, the rest of this will be a live software demo, is really an indicator of what Perfect Photo Suite 8.1 consists of, and it's eight different programs. Uh, things like Perfect Effects, Perfect Enhance, Perfect Portrait, Perfect Resize, Perfect Black and White, or B&W. Are, are you starting to see a trend, everybody? Everything's perfect in our world. Perfect Browse, Perfect Layers, and of course, Perfect Mask. This is an entire suite designed to enable you to speed up the way you work with your digital imagery. Um, and it's really aimed at professional, amateur, keen amateur, and absolute beginner photographers. Um, so that's the kind of stuff that On One Software manufacture. Now our suite is designed to work as an entire standalone solution. Um, so it's a standalone application of eight different programs, or it's an entire range of plugins that work with Adobe Photoshop CS4, CS5, and the Creative Cloud. It's a range of plugins that work inside of Adobe Photoshop Lightroom 4, 5, and the Creative Cloud Edition again. It's a range of plugins that work inside of Apple's Aperture and Adobe Photoshop Elements 10, 11, and 12. But the key focus these days is on a standalone program. This program will do 99% of what you want to do as a digital photographer. OK, so I'm going to leave my little slideshow and I'm going to quit something called Keynote because, by the way, I'm using a MacBook Pro tonight with 16 gigabytes of RAM. If anybody has any questions during this part of the webinar, and I think Richard's part of the webinar for data color as well, then type them into the questions panel of the GoToWebinar control panel. And I'm just going to quickly open up Adobe Photoshop for you to see. And the Adobe Photoshop interface will appear for you in a couple of seconds. And there'll be a picture in the workspace of a corridor in the Palace of Versailles in uh, Paris. Now, if you look at the interface for Photoshop, Richard, I'm not sure if you're still there, but can you see Photoshop OK? Yes, mate, yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Then 
In the bottom right hand corner, you'll notice an on one palette. That on one palette gives me access to all of the on one plugins. And you find that by going to Window and Extensions and on one. And if that on one is ticked, then you will see the little palette in the bottom right hand corner. In fact, it's dockable, so you can move it anywhere in the Photoshop interface. Perfect batch, black and white effects, enhance, everything is there. If, for instance, we decide to double click on perfect effects, perfect effects launches inside of Photoshop. And if I go to my filters and I type in a keyword search, for instance, called Earth, I find some presets. Now, this is just one of the components in the suite called Perfect Effects. We have a special offer on this, by the way. Uh, if you don't have any on one software products and you want to acquire one, then we're actually giving this one away free at the end of the webinar. Um, I think Data Color will send an email out to you saying thanks very much for attending the webinar. And in there will be a download link for this product if you want it. Not the whole suite but just perfect effects. Now, I'm going to click on a preset inside of perfect effects and apply it into my image. I can control the intensity or the opacity of the effect with this little slider. And once I reach the point where the corridor in Versailles suddenly looks very kind of damp and miserable. <laughs> Not that I want to make this eye look damp and miserable, but this is an effect called Earth, so that's the effect it tends to have. I then apply the effect back out into my Photoshop or into my Aperture or Lightroom or Elements to create an effect quickly for my image. And then I can save the image out as whatever I want to save it out as inside of Photoshop. If I look at the layers palette inside of Photoshop, the perfect effects layer is over the top of the original image. So it's a non-destructive process. The color for the image is obviously dependent on your screen and obviously therefore dependent on your calibration and accurate calibration of your screen and your printer and all your devices basically, which is why I always recommend data color. Now let's just leave Photoshop here. And I won't save the image because what I'll do instead is to go into Adobe Photoshop Lightroom. Now Lightroom, of course, is a raw-based workflow application beloved of an increasing number of digital photographers. I have an image on the screen which is a picture of me having my cup of tea. Um, and that's great. And the way I find my plugins inside of Lightroom is to go to File and then Plugin Extras. Now that list of Plugin Extras gives me access to something that I don't normally have inside of Lightroom and of course that is Layers. Layers inside of Lightroom. Lightroom and Aperture don't normally have layer support in them. But with the perfect photo suite, including perfect layers, it means I can do my masking directly within my Lightroom workflow. I can do blending and merging of images together directly within my Lightroom workflow or Aperture workflow. Okay, and then I have access to all the rest of my plugins as well. So our software is designed to work where you feel most comfortable. And where I'm gonna work and where I tend to feel most comfortable these days is in the suite in standalone mode. I'm gonna go into the entire suite now and take you through as many of the little components I can get through in about 15 minutes. Let's see how we do. Probably less than 15 minutes now. Now the first component of the suite that you see is something called Perfect Browse. Perfect Browse gives me access to my images wherever they are. Those images could be JPEGs, they could be TIFFs, they could be layered Photoshop files, they could be RAW files. We support dozens and dozens of different RAW file formats. So I have a Canon raw file format here of a young lady called Becky. It's a Canon EOS 1DS Mark III, so quite a powerful Canon. Um, and I have all the information 
for that particular image, which is stored on my desktop, but I have access to cloud services. So if I have my images on the cloud, then they'll all be found inside of my sources panel on the left-hand side of the screen. And from there and from desktop, I go down to a series of folders where I can find my particular pictures. Let's take this first image. It's a picture of a church. It's a church in uh, Abbeville in uh, Normandy in northern France. From Browse, I'm going to click on Perfect Layers. And when I do, I get a little splash screen that invites me to edit a copy of the image, edit the original, or add this picture as another layer. So we can build up layers and layers of images. I'm just going to say, edit a copy. And the file opens inside of Perfect Layers. Now this is a this is a typical Bob. I, I know Oliver is is somewhere online from from um, Data Coa listening to this, and he's a really good photographer. I'm terrible, happy to admit it. Got a reasonable camera, but I don't use it properly. So all my images are fairly touristy. They're all quite soft because I use cheap lenses because I don't like to spend a lot of money on my photography. And when I do take a picture, I end up with lots of distractions that need to be removed. And the first thing I need to remove is this little Mercedes estate car. And for that, I'm going to use the tool panel in the left-hand side of Perfect Layers. In particular, the tool in the middle called a Perfect Eraser. And I'm just going to change the size by hitting the bracket key and then start to draw over the car. And it's the car that's just sticking into the bottom left-hand corner of the image. Make sure I fill in all the gaps, let go of my mouse button, and the car disappears. This is content aware fill. It's the first time on one software has had a piece of uh, a tool in its armory this um, advanced. But I'm now going to remove all of these little distractions in the image and do it quite quickly, including that little manhole cover and the little bollard at the front disappears. Beautiful bit of retouching. It's working ever so fast. I'm now going to take out this road sign by just holding down the shift key to get a nice vertical selection. Remove the sign completely. Again, just make sure you fill in all the little gaps in that red mask. The sign disappears. Don't forget to remove the shadow. If you leave the shadow in there, somebody's going to know that you've been fiddling around with this picture. So remove the shadow. And perhaps we'll remove the street sign as well from the side of the church. I've got clone stamp tools here. I've got little retouching brushes, but this perfect eraser does a fantastic job, similar to content aware fill inside of Photoshop, but it's a little bit easier to use. We've tried to make all our tools as simple as possible. Now, let's just fit the image back into the workspace. We've done our retouching and we've done it very fast. What I'll do now is to go back into perfect effects with a single click. Remember, we're working in the suite in standalone mode. You could be using the suite of plugins from Photoshop, Lightroom, Aperture, Elements. Inside of Perfect Effects, we get an empty layer, and that empty layer is waiting for an effect. The effect I'll apply to the image, it's going to be an HDR, a high dynamic range effect, tone mapping, basically, of different exposures. I'm cheating by using a single exposure, and with a single click, I apply the effect into my image. Then I'll go to my filter options, and I'll apply a little more detail into the picture. I'm going to adjust the compression of the pixels, and the clarity of the image, and the vibrancy of the c color in the picture. And I've got a completely adjusted, exaggerated edges and tone. Now, because I've changed the preset that On One Software give you, and we give you hundreds of different presets, as you'll see, I'm going to take that preset now and save it. And I'm going to save the preset as, um, let's call it March 18th, data color 1. Why have I saved a preset? Well, I took exaggerated edges and tone from the HDR on one software provided presets. I used that as a starting point. I've adjusted my preset to fit the image. I'm hoping this is going to work on several more images. I'm now going to add a category 
called data color presets and say OK. The creator is Bob Campbell. That's me. If you decide you want this preset, by the way, just send me an email to the email address I mentioned at the start. I'll show it again before we disappear. And now say create. Now, that's great. We haven't done much work yet. It's already 17 minutes into the presentation. I'm going to cancel that particular image to get back to perfect layers. And in perfect layers now, I'm going to do some masking. I'm going to do some cutout, OK? So let's take an image. It's an image I've used before in the past few months. And it's this one. It's a picture of a tree. I'm going to close down the picture of the church, take this tree, and say, edit a copy. Tree appears in the middle of the workspace. It's a tree that looks quite interesting. It's quite a nice sort of angular lean to the tree. But I want to put a nice sky behind it. So I'm going to select a sky. It's a sky from Malta. And I'm going to say to this image, add as a layer. And when I click OK, the sky will appear on top of the tree. Great. What do I do with it now? Well, let's use a transform tool. I've got clipping tools, transform tools, cropping tools, all sorts of different brushes just inside of perfect layers. I'm going to take the sky and reposition it and flip it so that the sun comes in from the left-hand side of the picture. OK? And then I'll say, apply. Then I'm going to take the layer of the sky Drop it down behind the tree. If you're a Photoshop user, you'll recognize the processes involved here. The layers are a bit bigger for me and clearer inside of Perfect Layers. But there's my tree now selected. I'm going to go into Perfect Mask. And in Perfect Mask, we're going to cut away the blue background behind the tree to reveal that nice, new, rather more exciting, vibrant-looking sky. To do that, first of all, I'm just going to draw across the background because the software has automatically decided that it can create a mask of this sky without any help from me, apart from the fact that the mask looks pretty terrible. So I need to help the software make this better. Take the magnifying glass, zoom in, select some colors. These are colors that I want to keep in the image. So I'm going to go for a few of the midtones on the hedge. Then I'm going to select some colors to drop, the colors I want to lose in the picture. I'll go for some of those lighter blues. And then I select a brush. And then I start to mask. And look at the detail that we're getting in this mask. There's a little, little bit of blue fringing around some of the smaller, the tiniest branches on the image. But I think this masking process is actually really good. Now, I could use masking inside of Photoshop, but there are 14 or 15 different ways of doing it. And I can't, I'm just too old to remember all those different ways. I'm going to fit the image on the screen now and carry on drawing with my brush, make it a little bit bigger, and carry on the cutout process. You'll notice along the horizon, the hedge has some fringing on it. So I'm going to remove that. And that's great. And remember, I wouldn't be able to do any of this work unless I calibrated my screen. If I can't see the right colors in the image, then how am I going to know what the image is going to look like, for instance, when it's printed? Luckily, I did take the pictures, so I've got a vague recollection of what it should look like. But for me, I need to be able to see accurate color on my screen. And the way I do that is to use my Data Color Spider 4. And uh, it does a fantastic job. And actually, talking to the guys from Data Color, like Richard, they've convinced me that I should calibrate my screen more regularly. I was calibrating around about once a month. Now I do it once a week to make sure I get very accurate color. And you t I, bet you will, I bet they will tell me off for saying once a week. They'll probably say, ah, oh, you have to do it every day. I'm sure they won't, but it's not too bad. You never know, we might do. <laughs> Richard is going to shout at me, I know he is. <laughs> okay. once, once a week's perfect, Bob. That's well done. <laughs> Woohoo, I got it right. Yeah. <laughs> right. I just applied the image with the mask 
out of Perfect Mask into Perfect Layers. If I was working in Photoshop, I would say apply from Perfect Mask into Photoshop, from Perfect Effects into Photoshop, into Lightroom, into Aperture, into Elements. With the image selected now in Perfect Layers, I'm just going to take a new layer called a fill layer by clicking the little bucket icon at the bottom of the layers panel, say OK, and then take this tool in the Perfect Layers panel called the masking bug, click, click, select, click and move. And I've put a mist in my image. Very simple, very easy to do. I'm changing the feather on this brush and I'm just putting the mist there to make the image look a little more atmospheric. And then I can reduce the layer opacity a little bit if I need to using the layer opacity slider on the layers panel. I can then go to file and I can say save as. Now from the suite we can save out as a PSD file which will save the layers in my image or I can save as a TIFF, JPEG, PNG or a PSB file. I'll save as a PSD, I'll call it Lone Tree and I'll save it onto my desktop, just say save. Now we'll do another little exercise where we'll take the image and we'll convert it into a black and white. So let's just compress the layers that we have at the moment. Remember we saved the PSD already, so we're not going to lose this image. But what we'll do is just compress it, take it into perfect black and white. Now perfect black and white, or B&W, is a fantastic application that immediately gives you a black and white conversion. And using the same theme as presets, the theme runs through the entire suite from perfect effects through perfect black and white to resize to portrait to enhance presets. And presets are fantastic. 19th century processes, for instance. The image reproduced using a series of effects simulating those of famous photographers like Daguerre in France, who French obviously... Uh, say that Daguerre was the inventor of photography. We assume that uh, Fox Talbot was the inventor of photography within about a week of Daguerre. How weird is that? How strange. I'm not sure who was first. <laughs> Let's use a platinum print. Click on a platinum effect. Applies to my image. I'm going to take away a border that's been applied to the image as well. I just don't like the border, so I'm switching that off. I am going to switch on a vignette and I'm going to adjust the brightness of the vignette and <clears throat> that's great and the style is whatever the style we want it to be the size and the position of the vignette slightly off center but that's okay the roundness of the vignette applying more detail into the image if I want to so I can add more detail with a detail slider it just sharpens the image up a little bit or I can use a detail brush and I can pay more or less detail, more contrast or less contrast. I can apply any effect into here with a brush very accurately or with all of the sliders on the other side of the screen. And then once again, I can say apply. I'm only scratching the surface, as we say in the UK, of these effects. There are a lot of things that you can do in the suite. If somebody said, however, does this replace Photoshop? I would say no. Photoshop does far more than this suite will ever do. But then as photographers, we probably don't need everything that Photoshop gives us. If I was a graphic designer, and I used to be a graphic designer actually, I would use everything in Photoshop and I wouldn't use this suite in that particular role. But as a digital photographer, it's all fantastic. Just take a look at this little effect. Let's take away the tree. We won't save that. Just take a look at this. I'm going to double click on the last image, it's a landscape. So Richard, I'm just coming up pretty close to the end now. I'm going to say, edit a copy. You, you're fine for 10 minutes, to be honest, Bob, if you want. Okay, mate, that's fantastic. Thank you. It'd be, it'd be interesting, I don't know if you're going to show the, the, sort of the way the, uh, the hierarchy works in the, uh, the, in the suite as well, I think that'd be... No problemo. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll just do this and we'll, we'll take a look at that and, and whatever else I can think of. So let's take a look at, the, we've got one layer open at the moment. So it's a picture of a place called Mount Hood, which is in uh, Oregon, northwest USA. 
It's a good exposure for the sky, a terrible exposure for the foreground of the image. Let's take a second image and we'll add it as a layer. Say OK. By the way, I can select several images at once, add them all as layers so they become a complete layered uh, profile. So there's my second image on top of the first. Aligned using the transform tool, if I use the masking brush and increase the feather, reduce the opacity a little bit and start to brush, I can burn through from one layer into the other to gradually find Mount Hood in the background. The problem ha starts to happen when I try and get those trees nice and level. It's difficult with a brush. The overall effect is kind of okay, but I'm not really happy with the finish. So I'm going to undo, edit undo, or of course command or control Z. The keyboard shortcuts are exactly the same as you would be familiar with. Just like we created that beautiful fine mist on the tree, let's take that masking bug. One click, two click, select the right type of gradient fill, and a third click just to move the tool down to the tree line, and there we get our trees, and we get our lake, and we get the mountain in the background. A fantastically simple process, but beautiful if you think about it, because we could actually composite as many different layers of different exposures of this image as we would want to. The biggest problem might be aligning the images, but I'd use my transform tool and my blending modes to view the images together just to make sure that they match and fit. 23 different blending modes in the suite. Okay. Now, let's just take one last um, image. And for this one, I'll take this picture called Frosty Fence. Another bob, so slightly out of focus, cheap lenses. I'm sticking to that process. I'm too old to start spending my money. I'm going to say edit a copy. And the last thing we're going to take you through is a brand new plugin from On Once. A lot of the tools I've been showing you actually are brand new, but this one in particular is called Perfect Enhance. And Perfect Enhance does what it says on the tin. It enables you to enhance your images. But this software for me exemplifies what On One software is all about. And the nice thing about the software is that it caters for all levels of skill within digital photography because obviously thousands and thousands of people every day are starting out new in digital photography and there are lots of people still working with film and lots of professional photographers who are working with digital and know a thing or two about the kind of images they want to work with. If you're brand new to the business, you've got two options with this kind of software presets for co color corrections and enhancements to the image and a single click applies the effect or quick fixes contrast increase the contrast in the image just click on the little plus sign next to contrast vibrancy the saturation of the color temperature detail I'm just clicking on the little plus signs to add more detail to the image. It's looking fantastic actually already. Maybe brightness, just a fraction. What did the image look like originally? Go down to the little preview box in the bottom left hand corner. And by the way, this works as well for all of the components in the suite. Preview off, soft, bit dull, preview on, nice. Okay, so that's for the absolute beginner. How about someone who wants to go into a bit more detail? Let's go into color and tone adjustments where we can adjust the brightness, the contrast, the highlights, the shadows, the whites, the blacks, the levels of the image, the detail. I'm just going to add a fraction more detail. I just can't, can't get enough detail. And then color temperature, the tint, the vibrancy of the color. I can apply vignettes. There's my image. I'm just going to crop it. Take out that building, for instance. That's just in the wrong place. Crop the image. Apply. Image correction done. A ton of detail. And once again, I wouldn't be able to assess how good the detail and the color was in the image unless my screen had been regularly 
calibrated. <clears throat> if I'm happy with this picture, go to preset, save preset. Save the work that you've done, adjusting the color on this image, and then batch process a group of images using perfect batch, in fact. And then you'll be able to get everything moving in the right way. Let's just apply the effect back into our perfect layers. So the basic workflow inside of the um, standalone suite is simply a case of going from browse at the start of your day into perfect layers and then through into enhance and portrait and effects and black and white and mask and resize. Perfect resize, by the way, is probably the most powerful of all the components of the suite. It used to be called something called genuine fractals. It is still genuine fractals, it just has a new name. And what that enables me to do is interpolate the image to get perfect print, once again, as long as we're calibrated for good print. And perfect resize, if I just go there for a second, enables me to do things like this. If, for instance, I decide to use on one presets, and we decide that we want to enlarge this image and go for an Epson matte paper, and I'm going to go for a pretty big size here. I'm going to go for 40 by 50. And there's my image automatically set to a resolution of 240 dpi, 50 inches by 40 inches. What's that in real money, as we say? Let's go for millimeters. So it's 1.27 meters by 1.016. And that's a big file. It's a 451% enlargement, 695 megabytes, and that's going to print perfectly on an Epson printer because the resolution is set automatically, the sharpening is set automatically. Absolutely brilliant. So I even get fantastic output as well. Right. Once again, I would apply that into my Photoshop or into my Elements or into my Aperture or into my Lightroom. I'll just go back into Perfect Layers. And probably ready, Richard, to hand over to you, if uh, that's OK, if you want to get started on the, on the calibration. Excellent, stuff. Bob. Yeah, that was great, mate. Thank you very much. It's, You're uh, welcome. Some impressive stuff in there, definitely. And uh, like a true professional tying in the, the start, with the taking the photographs with printing out at the end, which, strangely enough, is exactly what I'm going to be doing in a few seconds tonight. <laughs> so, uh, Excellent. <laughs> now, you mentioned you, you've got a, a giveaway tonight, haven't you? So that's, uh, that's the code that you've um, it's the code. we're going to be sending out as part yeah. of the follow-up. Yeah? It's so. a, free, a free part of the suite called Perfect Effect. I, I think it's one of the stars of the suite, actually. But it's a kind of taster. It's a fully functional, free download of Perfect Effects. Not the whole suite, just Perfect Effects. And the link for that will be, I think, on the email that uh, Data Color sent out for us. Is that right? That's right, yeah, indeed. Yeah, that's, that's, Brilliant. Uh, that's cool. Okay, Richard, right, thank okay, you very much. So, well, thank you, mate. And um, uh, so, some exciting stuff there as far as retouching is concerned, concern, folks. And uh, we'll pick up on the same sort of theme now, and we're going to take you a again through uh, the trip through uh, your initial capture of, uh, of images and looking at how to correct that for you. And uh, a few ways in which we can hopefully tune that, uh, that workflow for you, such that uh, when you're retouching, you know that you can actually trust what you're seeing on screen, as Bob uh, alluded there in, uh, in his session. And, and also, I'll also finish up by talking a little bit about print at the back end of the process as well, because uh, obviously, um, as, as Bob showed there, with, uh, with the, the perfect resize, we can create these massive uh, prints, or you know, prints appropriate to any particular type of uh, print size you want to be going out, so A1, B1, whatever it may be, um, but uh, but also, of course, what we can do from a data color point of view is again enhance that and make sure that you are actually printing out correctly, so you know you're working in the correct colors as well. So uh, hand to hand, there's as if we were, we're two old staged pros that have done this a few too many times. But um, let's kick off with a, a look at uh, the the start of the process then, and how we can actually um, help you out in getting control of color when you're actually capturing in camera, basically. So we may all be familiar with this sort of scenario. I obviously had to cut down my image here, basically, just to get it onto the, the slide where. But you take a shot, and uh, effectively, you don't know whether that shot perhaps has a particular color cast to it or not. 
is, for instance, this a picture of maybe some green leaves in front of a white wall, or is it perhaps some limey green leaves in front of a beige wall? Well, you know, is it perhaps darker than we're actually seeing on screen now? Now, as Bob mentioned when he was talking about uh, his shots of that tree, you know, if you can remember exactly what those colours and that uh, that situation were when you when you took the photograph. You're a pretty clever person because uh, I certainly tend to not remember exact colours even if it's a few seconds after I've shot it because things change and light changes. So one of the key things in order to address this, now obviously not so important if you're taking a picture of some leaves in front of a wall, but more important if you're taking models, if you're taking scenes where you've got um, you know, something you really need to get the, the colour and the, the lighting and the cast correct for. And that could be, for instance, pack photography and uh, and that sort of uh, product photography, basically. But but ultimately, if you need to get those colours right, you need to have a frame of reference into your imaging workflow. Now, a classic thing to do that is something called a grey card. Uh, many of you may be using grey cards already out there. The downside with grey cards are a couple of things, really. Firstly, you need to get grey cards flat on to uh, your your uh, camera basically in order to uh, make sure you're capturing, well, not getting any inclement light that's sort of affecting that colour of grey that you're seeing on the card. So you, you, it comes down to angling it in the right direction can be an issue. And secondly, you've got the issue of course that grey cards are quite bulky, even if they fold up, they, if they fold up they, they get a bit creased and they can get messed up quite quickly. So at Data Colour we've got a, a solution here that actually takes us into the um, um, well, I think a, a far better situation, and it's something that every photographer ought to have. It doesn't matter whether you're a hobbyist, a professional, absolutely you should get one of these. And it's, it's a spider cube, basically. And it, it's essentially the, the equivalent or the improvement on a grey card. What it is is a little cube, as you can see here on screen, and it is cubic, it is a three dimensional device. Um, and that's uh, that's pointing with its corner towards us at the moment basically and as you can see it's something in this case we, we've just hung it into the shot but uh, you could for instance at the bottom there of the cube you can see that there's a, a little sort of a, a round uh, sticky outy bit for want of a corrector term um, and basically that is your tripod mount so you can actually tripod mount this or you can uh, as you can see hang it ultimately it's it's only about I don't know um, two inches maybe an inch and a half across or for those of us in uh, in new money uh, probably three and a half centimeters three centimeters something like that so so not really a massive um, guide or target but that's the point really with this what we're giving you here is something that captures multiple lighting points as you can see there's different grays and whites that we can see on here and it's also giving the opportunity to have it about your person wherever and whenever you may be because you can just slip it into your pocket, handbag, camera bag. You know, best to really keep it in, in your jacket pocket or um, you know, really close to you such that even when you're out and about with maybe just a, a smartphone you can be capturing images and getting the color right on those even as well. So um, key thing with it, the way it works is it is three dimensional and as mentioned it is pointing towards us at the moment. But if I come out of the slide where I press I can show you a bit more detail within uh, Camera Raw, I've got it popped open here. Um, basically we, we've got the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the cube visible there, same shot basically. And as you can see, the, I've turned on the, um, the out of gamut warnings here on the shot. So at the moment you can just see the, uh, the histogram at the top right hand side of the, uh, the Camera Raw window here. Shows you that we've got a lot of data on the right hand side. So what that's saying is it's overexposed. And there's virtually no data on the left hand side. So definitely overexposed. And if you're not familiar with looking at histograms, this little graph, what we need to do is really sort of balance that out a bit better so we've got a bit more even distribution of colors and information across this graph here. And we've got these two little uh, icons on the top right and left hand side of it, one blue and one white. Um, high, as, as I've held over it there, it says highlight clipping warning. So it's an out of gamut warning basically. And with those turned on, for anything that's too dark, i.e. more than 100% dark, you get a blue area showing where that is. And for anything that's too light, i.e. over 0% over or 100% white basically, uh, you get a little red remark, a little red um, areas as you can see on the screen here. 
And the key thing we know with this guide, so this little spider cube has some known areas here. Now these two look subtly different, these sort of grey tan colours we're seeing at the moment, but actually they're both 18% greys. And the reason why we're seeing this left hand side looking lighter and getting this out of gamut warning here is because at the moment we've got lighting coming in from the left hand side. Now we can't see that particularly on the, the, the image just as we look at it, but we can see it evidently from the fact that okay, those greys aren't looking the same and the whites evidently aren't looking the same because which is on the right hand side it looks white obviously this isn't overexposed whereas this one is and what we need is to first of all set our grey point or uh, our white point for our uh, setting our color taking any color casts out of our software so in camera raw here for instance we've got a little uh, drop and picker up here the white balance tool just pick that up and drop that into our um, our white area here and just just reduce out and straight away you should see that um, that instant removal of cast here basically so we're getting that cast removed from our, our image so we now know in answer to the original question was there a, a yellow or a, a white or a, you know how green were those leaves we now know how green and how white everything was that's uh, so somewhere in between basically so none of our guesses were correct but what we've got here now is the opportunity to actually get our exposure and hence our gray balance for the image correct. So what we're going to do is we're going to start off by moving to our exposure control because if we're overexposed then we want to drop down that exposure basically using the, the tool until you can see that, uh, that white area comes back in here. So that left hand side white area you can now see hasn't got any out of gamut warnings on so great we're back within tolerance so what that means is if we're printing it you'll get dots in there basically so there should be some detail in there and that's good for if you're taking for instance landscape photography you don't get burnout in clouds you don't uh, you know, lose all the detail and perhaps if you're in weddings you, you won't get that loss of detail in the, in the gown for instance if it's a white gown that is of course um, you can see I've still left this little amount of uh, red here, this little highlight here. And we can turn that on and off just to see what's under it. And what's under it is a burnout area, but that's because this ball is intended to be a scintillation area, as we call it. So anything that is out of gamut, or if we want it to be out of gamut, that's really where we ought to spot it there. So, so we're happy to leave that in. So now we're almost there. We've taken out the cast. We've set our exposure correct from the highlight perspective. And we can see the histogram is starting to spread out here, this graph at the top right hand side. But what I want to do is just adjust those blacks because we've actually got something down the bottom here. We, we have known areas here. So this is a 96% white. That's as I say, is an 18% gray that we're looking at, that gray quadrants there. Um, down here, we've got a 4% black around the outside of our little hole here. And that is a, a hole, that little white dot, uh, that little black dot. And that black dot is intended to give us the equivalent of that ball, it's a, it's a black catch light if you like, so it shows us where we've got 100% black. So we're going to be able to see that by just grabbing our, or get the right level of black I should say, by just grabbing our black slider and reducing that down up until the point where we start seeing that, that blue out of gallant warning that I was telling you about, just filling in that hole. And we've got that hole filled in, now we know that, okay great, we've now got to a point where we're actually happy with the contrast ratio of the shot, the exposure is correct, and we know we've taken the cast out. So at this point, great, in camera roll, for instance, we can uh, save that as a preset, so just go down here, save settings, and then we can apply different presets to different shots later on. So if we've got multiple shots, we can actually go back in, we don't have to do the same job again and again, we can just set this correct. And that's the whole purpose of these these guides at the start of the, these targets at the start of our workflow. The intention here is to shoot something that we know color-wise, we know the values of this color, uh, of this uh, this cube, and then we can adjust our images to correct them based on those known readings, basically. And then once we've done that, in these lighting conditions, you can then apply that same selection of, of white balance and uh, tonality, so the, the, the same preset here, to any image taken in the same lighting conditions, and it will correct it, correct them accordingly. So you'll take out any any cast, etc., etc. So straight away, you don't have to guess how tanned people are, what color a particular you know, cloth may be. You know, it's set for you here, or at least certainly to a certain extent. In fact, what we're going to look at in a second is something that's actually going to extend that remit a bit further. But first of all, let's just sort of write, remind you a bit about the cube. As I mentioned, it's, um, it's a nice solid cube top tips about this. It's uh, something you really should have in your pocket, but 
if you happen to um, actually want to wash your clothes at any stage, then basically you'll be doing that with detergents. And detergents contain little whitening agents, little bleaching agents, to make the clothes seem that much newer and shinier, etc. And of course, it's a bad thing if you're putting something that is aimed at a known color target or white balance target in your pocket with that detergent still clinging on in there even after it's been dried. So top tip, if you get one of these delightful spider cubes, and they really are worthwhile getting a you know, top, uh, top device to have on you at all times, then basically keep it in its bag. Just pop it into its bag, and of course that means that uh, you won't get that uh, De uh, deterioration with uh, with time, and also probably easier to show you now. I've got this slide up. You can see the the, the shaded area on the left hand side in this instance, and the, the lighter area on the right hand side. The purpose of it being three dimensional is the fact that it doesn't matter if the lighting is coming in from a particular direction, a side basically, or if it changes even. Whichever is the lighter side is the side that you choose to set that white point, that white balance point, to start the process. So it really gets around that sort of having to have things flat on to get the right reading that you get with grey cards. So really a uh, cracking piece of kit and as it says here, you know, it's scratch resistant and, uh, and tough and basically it is impregnated all the way through. So if you, if you do uh, happen to scratch it and try really hard, I'm sure you can scratch anything, um, then basically you'll, uh, you, you're still, you know, if you scratch the 18% quadrant there, you'll actually see that that's 18% uh, all the way through. So Robust, great little device. I mean, I, I've had mine for three or four years now. I'd suggest you probably get a lifetime out of it, one of these if you can, if you take care of it. It's a really cool piece of kit. Now, that's taking care of getting us started and getting our colours right. And it forms actually just pop it there. Just forms a part of this range of of different uh, devices we have for this capture. And we do, we also do uh, things at Data Color for uh, checking your calibration of your your autofocus, for instance. So part of a range there. But I'm I'm going to cover the the other key device. And this is, this, as far as I'm concerned, is the best thing in my camera bag. Actually, better than my cameras in my case. But uh, that's possibly because of what I do with them. Um, essentially. What we're talking about now is something that solves this perennial problem that anybody who takes any location photography, um, maybe studio photography or product photography, will really appreciate changing lighting conditions. And obviously, in this case, we're at a wedding. So fundamentally, wedding being a classic example, you'll start taking shots in, for instance, the church. You'll then move into taking shots uh, later on, perhaps in the reception, and also at some point you'd be outside. So three different lighting conditions causing this change in tonality between them because you've got three different color uh, casts being affected, at least in, in this scenario. Now we want to be able to get to this situation don't we, where everything's been neutralized and basically we can now trust what we're seeing is correct. So we know that those little chocolates there are the right color, we know that the dress is the right color, we know that the, the bride and groom don't look as if they've been uh, uh, out getting sunburned before the, the wedding day. So we've got another solution here and it takes what we do with the cube and extends it. So as opposed to just having the three known color areas, or I suppose five if you count the catch lights, but the, uh, the, the three gray areas, the white, the 96%, the 18% gray and the uh, 90 uh, or the 4% uh, uh, black stroke gray or dark gray that we get in the cube. Here we've got something that has 50 plus colors and uh, shades of gray. And it's something we can use to really get a control of our colors in our photography environment. So once again, let's quickly pop into the joys of um, a live example here. Now this time we're using this in, in Lightroom. So what we've got is uh, doing a photo shoot and we've got uh, a whole bunch of different uh, lighting additions. So at some point we've, we've shot said spider checker. and we've been able to crop it down. And one of the key things about the spider checker is it's quite quite a big piece of kit. You know, it's sort of uh, about the size of a, a tablet computer, I suppose, is the best uh, scenario. Now, the benefits of it being that big, because there are other devices out there for doing this sort of thing, but they all tend to be sort of pocketable, small things. The key thing with the, the spider checker is, and why it was the first and the best and uh, the most popular device for this, I, I believe, is the fact that you can hit this from a distance. So if what you're doing, wanting to do is set the lighting correctly for a group shot, for instance, or even landscape photography, 
you can drop this in from a distance and with a decent lens you can shoot it and still be able to have more than one pixel per color when you crop it down. So that's what we need to do first in the process is crop it down. And then this very quick process, we just basically once we're in here, again we're going to use this to set the lighting conditions and correct the lighting conditions so that we know we've got the colors correct in this shot and then we can apply that across a whole batch of other shots. So first of all we go in here and I know that uh, to be honest there wasn't really any, uh, any uh, poor lighting or any cast really in this scenario. So I know that I've got my, my whites again around 96%, blacks again about 4% down the bottom here. What I want to do then is just use our color picker and speed up because we're running out of time. But I'm going to lay it on the, or pick, up, pick the color, the, the white point from this square here, square E2. So I'm just going to pick that as a 12% white. And basically that's now set that, or remove that cast in the same fashion that we use the cube for. You can actually use the cube and the spider checker together. There's a little uh, pop-up spindle at the top of the, uh, the spider checker. We can't quite see it because I've cropped it out here. But that can pop up and you can then screw your cube in so you've got that opportunity to have something that is um, taking care of the lighting conditions coming in from different angles and also something to set your color charts by. So great. We've, we've set our initial... Um, white balance here, we've checked that uh, the grey and white points basically, or the black and white points. Now what we're going to do is just pop into, uh, in this case, the Spider Checker app, because this device, as opposed to the Cube, Cube doesn't come with any software, it just relies on you using uh, the relevant colour pickers to, uh, to set your um, white points in, in the scenario. Here what we're doing is we're actually booting it with, open with the, uh, the Spider Checker software, and it's Mac or PC, doesn't matter which, but uh, at the end of the day you've got the opportunity here to Take that original shot, there is it behind there. Just give you a chance to catch up on your screen refreshes. And over that we've got this selection of known colors, which we what we need to do is just align those over the relevant colors. They are actually the, the actual same colors. These, these are effectively exactly what we did before. The computer software in this case knows what each of these color values is. So therefore we just align those over the, the relevant squares on the picture. And then basically we can set some specific biases to the type of photography we're doing. But fundamentally, I mean, in this case, we come out of Lightroom. So what we're going to do is we just going to save the calibration down into, into, uh, into the software it's come from. So uh, we'll save this as, um, I don't know, what is it, Tuesday? Probably is, isn't it? Tuesday. Evening two zero. Okay, so click on OK, and basically that's taken our uh, our readings there, and immediately compared every one of those little squares with the known values, and allowed us to create a um, a little preset down here. Now, instantly you'll see here actually it's not popped into uh, our Lightroom software because a little nuance of Lightroom is you do need to uh, for any external presets you just need to quick Lightroom very quickly, so skip out the back time, the, the backup, and then reopen the software just to uh, pop that open if we can find it. Where is it? <laughs> there we go. Just pop it back open and that will allow us to open up the, uh, the relevant uh, image to see exactly um, what that would look like in the correct lighting. So if I scroll down here now, give you a chance to catch up. We should see it's Tuesday evening 20 there, so as I roll over that, if I click on that, you're probably not going to see a vast amount of change at home depending on your screens. If I just take that off again, so F or Shift or Command Shift to just switch it back again. If you look at that top left hand um, peach colored, skin colored um, square there, you'll see a particular a shift in that. So you can see here this was really affecting the, the, the tonality of the, um, uh, the skin tones and so on. So if, if I now take a whole bunch of shots that were actually shot in that lighting condition, I can now just apply that Tuesday evening 20 to all of those and you'll see just a, a subtle shift there and uh, perhaps if I choose a different one up here, perhaps that uh, show a bit more of a change if we can find I don't think you're going to see anything major on this, but perhaps if I hold us back over the grid, if I just roll over the uh, the uh, spider checker here, you should be able to see some subtle changes within the the thumbnails, basically on that uh, that setup. Or, or just have a look at the the uh, histogram top right hand side, because you'll see what differences that's actually affecting. You see there, that was a bit of a substantial one. So these are all just not necessarily in this case the correct. Um, preset to be applied, but uh, you, hopefully you've got the gist that take the correct preset, so back to that little scenario of being in the church, you'll go out there and basically you'll be shooting 
uh, the joys of shots outside of, uh, outside of the, the wedding, shots in the church and shots in the, um, in the uh, yeah, reception, and take this out at some point, your spider checker out at some point, and shoot that once in each of those lighting conditions. It doesn't have to be right at the start or at the end, it could be just at some point when everybody's out of the way and you've got the chance to shoot it, but just needs to be take, taken in those lighting conditions. So really great way of making sure you, you're controlling that and of course if you apply the right preset for the right lighting conditions to all the set of photographs, then ultimately the shots that were taken, for instance, in the church that may be a bit too uh, red, too, too, too warm, will be reduced down. The shots outside that may be a bit too light, a bit too washed out, will be warmed up, and you'll balance out all of those photographs. So, we're, we're kind of running out of time, so I'm very swiftly going to cut to the, the chase as to how we can improve the rest of your workflow. Key thing here is get one of these. Bob mentioned he used it once a week. It's his Spider Elite, in this case, Spider 4, basically. And this is the, the cornerstone of color management. Uh, fundamentally, this is your tool to, as you can see here, run some software on your computers. It doesn't matter what the computer is, in fact, it could be Mac or Windows. Actually, it can't be Chrome, but uh, Mac or Windows, basically. But it doesn't matter what the screen is, you can effectively calibrate a whole bunch of different styles of screens just by running this software and connecting up your spider, it's a USB based device, and popping it when it gets to the relevant step in the software, very simple steps in the software, uh, and pop it on the screen in the area that you can see here that it's uh, indicated. And what happens is that the, the software, very similarly to what we've been doing with the spider checker and the spider cube, the software has a range of different color swatches. It runs in front of the eye. There's a little eye on this device, or a little sensor with a whole bunch of uh, filters in there, and it reads basically those those colors. It knows or the software that comes with it knows what those colors should be, and it gives you this opportunity basically to color balance your screens, to color manage your screens. So it produces what we call a profile to enable those to be color managed basically. And of course, because it's using transmissive color, i.e., anything that emits color, you can calibrate, for instance, things like uh, your tablet computers and your phones as well. So if you're using those to show off your portfolios, then get a spider and you can download the app from either the Google Play or the iTunes Store for either of those two types of tablets. And then basically you can be uh, calibrating your screens accordingly. So one thing we probably ought to mention is there are three different sorts of them, uh, and you're included in there is, is the Express, the sort of the, the entry level version of the device. Um, very affordable, but it gives you the opportunity to get your colors right, even if you are doing this as just a hobby. You still want to get your colors correct um, for making sure that when it prints out or when you get them sent anywhere, that they actually look the same as when you started. And effectively, what the Express does is, is it'll work on one machine with one screen. So if you have a laptop, for instance, it'll work on that screen. You can, by all means, put it onto a different machine, um, but it will only work on one screen on the other machine as well. So it's limited to one screen per machine. The Pro, most popular with the photographers, uh, our device there really allows us to do multiple screens on single machines, so that's great. And the Elite has a whole bunch of extra technology turned on in there, allowing you to do multi-sampling across the screens and so on to make sure you've got consistency of color across your screens, but also allows you to do studio matching as well, such that I can use this to match different computers within my studio and make sure all of them are in, in tune and color managed. Um, Worthwhile mentioning to you folks that uh, we have a special extended offer on our um, Express uh, product. The moment. It's a time limited offer, but we are doing the Express on our, uh, our web store. Um, and I'll give you the URL for that in a second. And that's at a reduced rate of uh, $79. So you need to go there. I think there's a special code for that. But the, the code is on the website. It's not exactly too tricky to uh, to get that promo code and pop that in. Um, more importantly, and this is the, the actual store site. So you can see that the Express is normally about 117 euros. Now, for those of you not in a euro zone, uh, that's what we trade in in the, in the European uh, uh, area for... Uh, for money, so if you happen to be based in the UK as I am, you can go in there and perhaps at the moment get an even better deal because of the uh, exchange rate between the pound and the euro, keeping those euros flowing. 
Uh, more importantly, if you are trading across borders and you have a VAT code, you can also pop it in and get the VAT removed, the VAT removed uh, at source. So it could be useful for some. Now, most importantly for you tonight, folks, we're also offering you a special offer on the data color products. Now, with this code, that's WebUK20, all one word, all lowercase, WebUK20. And then basically, if you go to our store, go to the, the URL there, which is spider datacolor.com forward slash orders. There's no three W's in there, it is just a straight HTTP uh, colon slash slash at the start there. If you go to that URL and you want to get any of our products, if you'd like to look at the Spider Checker or the Cube, for instance, there, or you want to take us up on uh, any of these offers, then you've got uh, a 20% uh, discount with this code there, basically. Um, you won't see that until you actually go to the checkout, so it'll, it'll just show you the um, the uh, current pricing on the, the website until you get to that checkout. Unfortunately, you can't combine the two codes. You can't use the uh, the code for the Express with this code. So this essentially is just extending that uh, that deal on the Express, or nearly nearly getting as good on the rest of the product range there, basically. So we've got, got some good um, pre-Easter uh, prezzies for you there as far as the, the software from Bob, and a couple of uh, good promotions from ourselves. Now, one last thing to mention. We've talked about print a few times. Now, if you do want to get your print correct, we haven't got time to talk about it tonight, but um, just to give you an idea, we do do something called the spider print. And this is a very similar device. You print out a whole range of different uh, color charts on whatever printers you've got. And then you can use our device here to actually color or set up a, a color profile for those, de those uh, relevant devices. Um, as I said, not actually got the time to uh, go into any real detail on that tonight, I'm afraid, folks. but. Uh, Key thing with that, make sure when you're profiling your devices, use that to soft proof in the software that you're using in order to get things out correctly. Now, if you want any further details, because we've dashed through the color management piece tonight, uh, then basically go to this URL, pop in your details, and you can download our ebook. And it's uh, fantastic, uh, loads of information there, 90 plus pages of uh, all how to do things as far as color management is concerned. Um, likewise, if you need any, any further tips and tricks, there's a whole bunch of videos and cartoons we've got on, on our YouTube channel, so therefore go and have a, have a search around on our website for that. Again, that's the uh, same spider.datacolor.com website, so go have a look for that. Um, and uh, also, don't forget that we've uh, we've got a delightful team of, of uh, technical gurus who, if you have any burning questions on color management, you can either give a call on that free phone number from uh, the UK, or go to our website and pop in a question on our ticket support line there. So again, you can find that through the support tab on our uh, Data Color Spider uh, website. Let me remind you folks that we have this special offer tonight from the Data Color team, so you've got some discounts, 20% discount on uh, our range of products there um, from our SRPs, only available, uh, only discount only applicable, the code there only applicable on our web store at that URL, spider.datacolor.com forward slash orders. So with that, we've run over a few minutes, I hope you don't mind folks, I will say thank you very much. We'll now be opening up the, uh, the session for questions if anybody has any, and uh, I will say once again thanks to Bob. Now Bob's still around, so hopefully if you've got questions on uh, the On One software, then he'll be able to answer those. Um, I think at this point I will uh, say uh, perhaps if uh, uh, Oliver's there, he can open up the questions side of things. Yes, I um, switched on the option to to ask questions. So um, just check your Go to Webinar tool. Um, there is a little chat box now so you can type in your questions we will read your questions and we will answer them so everybody can hear your question and your answer and um, yes of course without your name so <laughs> that um, yes here is the first question so Bob how again do you align layers of the same image um, use the transform tool the tool at the top of the tool palette in perfect layers so first of all, I mean, it depends on the kind of image. If we're looking at something like high dynamic range, 
where you want to effectively tone map. We, we don't tone map per se. We leave that to other great products like Photomatics and there's a few others besides. But if you do want to align your images and then blend and merge them together and perhaps use the um, masking bug, which is what I did with the pictures of the volcano, select the transform tool on any of the layers and then use the blending modes so that you can see a transparent ghost image, if you like, of the bottom layer and align it to that. It's, it's not a difficult process, but it just takes a little bit of practice. Try and shoot the images perfectly aligned always by using a tripod and uh, some kind of radio control for your camera so you don't move it. But good alignment will normally work with the transform tool. OK, thank you. So the next, uh, and by the way, um, I'm Oliver from Data Color, just to, to mention that. <laughs> the promo for Spider is only for today. Mm, no, no, it's for around a week. Um, so. It was until the 23rd, so it's until this weekend. So 23rd okay, of, so, the, uh, yeah. uh, of the month. Thank you. Yeah. Thank I think you. The, the, so. the, the other one's time limited as far as the Express is concerned, but I don't think we've got an end date uh, listed on that at the moment. So uh, probably the end of the month, but I, I don't know. Yeah, that is that is um, um, mentioned on our website on the data color website. So a short link to that is spider.datacolor.com without www in the beginning, just HTTP and then spider.datacolor.com. Um, thank you for your time. Have a nice weekend. Yeah, same to you. So any further questions? I can't believe it. Here is no. <laughs> We're so good. We've we've answered everything during the presentation. Well done, Richard. Yeah. We, we've done a good job, haven't we, Bob? Absolutely. There was, uh, yeah. I, mean, I mean, the whole how often should you do it? You covered that off, and um, uh, we we didn't get a look at the, uh, the the perfect browse in your case, did we tonight? We just started in browse. Um, oh, I don't yeah. tend to use it very much because all my images are on the desktop. Ah, if I had okay. a, if I had cloud services, I'd probably use browse a bit more. Here oh, yeah, is okay. somebody ask. Oh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, here's someone asking, uh, what about on one promotion? So I think the first um, uh, that I need to mention now here is that you offering um, that uh, uh, um, perfect effect. Yeah, cards, yeah, right. Perfect effects. Perfect uh, effects premium edition, which is mm -hmm. one eighth, if you like, of the suite, will be free. So uh, what uh, I think what the do you send a, a follow-up email, guys, out to yeah, the will be tomorrow, yes. attendees? Mm -hmm. So if you can have the URL where they go and download it, that, it's, then... It'll already be right. available, yeah, don't worry. Right. Great, so, thanks. So. That will be mentioned or uh, listed in our, in our follow-up email. So, um, Thank you, that will, be, that will be sent tomorrow, then. So um, thanks to Bob. Uh, see you next time. That's from okay. uh, Joseph. Maybe you know him. I'm not sure. Uh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't. I, You're not I, leading up to that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so any further questions? Um, not yet, but let's see. Thank, you, Thank you for all info. I found this session very interesting from a student photographer. Oh, cool. That's that great. Nice, yeah. nice to hear we're uh, uh, hitting the, uh, the next generation as well, so that's cool. Yeah. I can't believe that. No further questions. That means you've really done a good job. Yeah. That's what we like to hear. So, well, if they do have any questions, of course, they know that they can always uh, hit the um, uh, the support lines and, uh, yeah. and drop us a line that way, can't they? So. Um, right. Right. You saw that uh, phone number um, in the last yeah, slide that. that yeah that Richard showed yeah. Uh, to you. So there was a double O eight hundred seven hundred eight hundred seven O number. That double O is really it's not a mistake. Um, please dial a double O in the beginning. Otherwise, you will re uh, you will reach. I think it was Orange, um, the phone company. <laughs> so with right. just one single O. Mm -hmm. um, our uh, free of charge number or free toll number is a um, uh, uh, European wide um, f uh, free toll number. So that's you know, the no, I've always why. wondered about that. I, that's worried me. But uh, yeah. thanks. That's that's yeah. answered one of my questions. Yeah. Cool. That is that is uh, the reason why you need to dial a double O in the beginning. Okay. So then, um, yes, yes, we will uh, help you there if you have a bit um, more, let's call it more complex question. 
um, about color management or about your spider or how to use that spider correctly with that and that and that tool or software or whatever you want. Um, it's a bit more efficient um, for you to uh, submit a ticket in our ticket system so we can provide you with links to videos or, or uh, we sent you PDFs that describe these steps or uh, we can explain it, um, of course, in that email individually for you. In a phone call, it's a bit hard to, to do that in just uh, five minutes, round about um, that. And then afterwards, uh, you try to, to reproduce all that. That is sometimes a bit, a bit too much, a bit too complex. But uh, of course, then in tickets, um, yeah, that's a bit more safe in, in that case. So um, no further question. Yeah, again, that's um, a good job. So uh, I'm, I'm gone. Um, yeah, so it's, um, I think, Richard, up to you to say bye. Yeah, I did. Well, um, obviously, first of all, thank you all for attending, and most importantly, thanks, Bob. Well, actually, equally importantly, I should say, thank you, Bob, for for being on tonight and uh, showing us and wowing us with the uh, the latest from On One again. Thanks, guys. It was a pleasure. It's always uh, nice to work with you. Yeah, cool. No, good working with you, mate. And uh, enjoy the gadget show for anybody who's uh, in the UK. I, I gather that Bob's going to be up there. Uh, also, you'll have more chance to see the software uh, at, at the show. So uh, go and yep. see him in Birmingham at the NEC. Uh, Bob's very home from home, basically. Uh, I gather <laughs> somewhere around April the 9th. So uh, make sure you get up there to see him. Um, so yeah, and uh, likewise, thank you, Oliver, for, for hosting and uh, running the evening. And uh, thank you all again for, for being here tonight. And we'll see you sometime in the not-too-distant. I will look forward to talking to you again. All right. Thank you, Carly.